Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Gold. I am a research professor in the School of Natural Resources within Kaffner and associate director in the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry. And as part of our virtual Missouri Chestnut Roast, I'm going to be talking today about growing Chinese chestnuts, which is very appropriate for a chestnut roast. This is the outline of my presentation. I want to talk about why we have a Missouri or Midwest chestnut industry and go into a little bit about why we're going to build that industry and what we already know. The Center for Agroforestry's approach to developing chestnuts. Um, brief highlight on a whole bunch of production aspects, site selection, soils, establishing the orchards, managing the orchards, diseases and pests, harvest and post-harvest. Talk a little bit about a way to make money while the chestnuts are young, which is chestnut alley cropping. Briefly describe our financial decision support tool and talk a little about what we've learned about markets and marketing. And finally, close up with what do you do with chestnuts, which is a lot. So why a chestnut industry and why in Missouri? Well, we've been collecting data for a couple decades and we know that the U in the US chestnut industry, the full-time chestnut producers are in the wonderful position where demand for chestnuts is outstripping supply, which means you can sell everything you have. And second point, growers of high quality chestnuts who understand marketing receive very high prices for their production. Uh, the USDA National Ag Census between 2012 and 2017 shows a 12% growth in acreage and a 78% growth in the number of US chestnuts farms because farmers are catching on that chestnuts are a good investment. At the Center for Agroforestry, our chestnut improvement program, which began with Dr. Ken Hunt in the late 1990s, is focused in five main areas. We've been doing long-term testing of known chestnut cultivars, and we've been looking at optimizing orchard production, management, and harvest techniques. We've done a great deal of market and consumer research to support that. We've worked a lot to increase consumer awareness and demand. Now with Dr. Ron Revord and our Center for Agroforestry, we're entering a new phase of actually chestnut breeding to develop new cultivars and better progeny. And what we wanna do is provide so solid science-based information to our growers. And ultimately, we think that Developing co-ops of growers is going to be a really good way to grow and develop a thriving Missouri Midwest chestnut industry. So we know four very important things about the chestnut industry for Missouri. Can we grow them? Yes, without any question. Are the yields good? Absolutely yes. Are there markets? Yes, indeed. And are prices good? Yes. So once you get those four yeses, it's time to move forward with the industry. As I said, we've been doing this since the late 1990s, and we know that Chinese chestnuts in particular grow well in mid-Missouri and the Midwest. Our data shows that annual yields of our best cultivars yield 40 to 80 pounds or more per tree per year. And if you scale that up to 50 trees to the acre, that's two to 4,000 pounds per acre. We also know that irrigation moisture is key to annual crop success and also that the trees always need to be in full sun. You can never allow the trees to crowd or you lose production. We have 60 plus cultivars under test at our horticulture and agroforestry research center. And of those 20 years out, we think there's about seven real good cultivars. So in Missouri with the climate that we have with our good soils in the river hills and good management, commercial production should be based on growing tested chestnut cultivars. There are successful growers throughout the USA, throughout the Midwest, and as I said, they can't meet demand, and consumers, when they're introduced to chestnuts, are receptive. What do we know about the market quickly? Direct to market retail and wholesale prices are high. Wholesale prices range from two to $4 a pound, retail from four, 450 to $8 a pound. Because there's so much demand, most producers sell raw, fresh chestnuts and don't even bother with value-added 
products because they can sell everything right out of the cooler. Producing a quality chestnut is essential for any marketing and also providing point of sale information is critical. And you can see down on the right, our fourfold point of sale information brochure, which you can download for yourself. So a quick overview, you can see our growing Chinese chestnut in Missouri guide off on the right of production and marketing for chestnuts. And all this information is covered in more detail in the guide. So I wanna talk about site requirements and soils, planting and establishment and how to arrange the orchard. Uh, the fact that we do need to irrigate because chestnuts size up in August and often in Missouri, we have a hot dry period in August. So we, th we think for quality chestnuts, you need to have trickle irrigation set up for sure. Touch briefly on our financial decision support tool, cover briefly the key insects and diseases, talk a little bit about preparation for harvest and harvest, post-harvest, and then markets. So chestnuts like gently sloping, south-facing slopes and well-drained fertile soils with good air drainage so you don't have frost damage, and also, as I said, access to irrigation. What kind of soils? Well, silt loam soils are ideal. And slightly acid soils, pH 5.5 to 6.5 with good deep profile, three to four feet or more, and good internal drainage. So chestnuts like well-drained soils and they like moisture, they're spoiled. But when you put those two together, you get incredible production. We are fortunate all along the Missouri River on both sides and up and down the Mississippi, we have something called the Miss, Miss Missouri River Hills. And as you can see all along the Missouri River Hills, we have two soil series, Menfro and Knox, which are silt loams and they are perfect for growing chestnuts. Okay, to establish chestnuts, you can plant seedlings or you can plant grafted trees. Regardless of how you do that, you have to protect them from the deer. So what we recommend is putting in a five foot tall woven wire cage and anchor that cage on both sides with three eighths inch rebar about four feet long and that will securely hold the trees in place but prevent the rabbits and the deer from bothering the trees. Once your seedling trees are in the ground and growing for one or two years, you can come in with cyan wood from cultivars and you can top work them and graft your own cultivars into your orchard, which is what Ken Hunt has done uh, in the center in the right photos. We also use a 10 foot metal post to protect against wind damage and shape early tree form. When would you plant the orchard? Well, spring is the right time, late March to early May. We prune to a central leader. As you can see in the lower left slide, we use a four foot vegetation free strip to let the trees really grow and not compete with the weeds. And you can use Roundup or you could use pine straw as a good mulch for chestnuts. You can see in the picture down in the lower center, we have the tree uh, under trickle irrigation growing with a nice clear strip beneath the tree. So establishment, here in Missouri, we know that we can use grafted cultivars to great success. So what we recommend for orchards in Missouri, where we can graft cultivars, is to plant the cultivars in double rows. So if you look at the bottom right of the screen, you can see two rows of our cultivar called Ching, followed by two of core, followed by two of Ching, repeating two of core. And when you do that, you find that the ching and the core will cross pollinate and they're no more than 30, 40 feet apart, depending on your spacing. And we think this is ideal, not only for production, but for harvest, because the ching will all ripen at the same time, the core will all ripen at the same time. So it makes for very efficient harvesting. We would also suggest no more than 60 feet apart between trees, especially when they're young, so you have good pollen flow and good nut set. We use a, dil a dilute, 50% dilute latex paint on the lower stem, and you can see that right here where my cursor is, to prevent sun scald because in the winter when the sun sets, it can warm up the bark and then immediately go to freezing and you can have frost crack and that damage here. But if you paint it with latex paint, that does not happen. Your planting arrangement really depends on the individual landowner and their equipment and their future plans. 30 by 30 feet, 20 by 20, 
20 by 40, ultimately thinning to 40 by 40. But ultimately, as this picture is in the center, you want full sunlight around every tree always for maximum production. You do have to fertilize your trees, and you can see the details here, but we do recommend a split application of N fertilizer, and you can see an excellent, rapidly growing young chestnut tree out at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center in this photo. Okay, chestnut orchard production. As you can see here in the lower left, when the chestnuts are just being established, basically there's full sunlight on your site. So what are you gonna do before you get any yield? You can intercrop, and we call that alley cropping. You can intercrop winter wheat, corn, soy, pumpkins, you name it. And so these are some pictures from the Stouffer Farm in Napton, Missouri of chestnut production intercropped with winter wheat. And here you can see the trickle irrigation line. When the trees get older, you stop intercropping with uh, a commercial crop and you shift to some kind of a grass cover so that you can have a good pickup surface when the trees are bearing nuts heavily. So again, we recommend triple trickle or drip irrigation or even fertigation. And then I have some kind of bluegrass clover cover that can be mowed nice like a lawn when the harvest age is there so that you can pick up the nuts easily. Again, in our Growing Chinese Chestnut Guide, and you can see the URL for the uh, PDF of the guide below, we recommend a handful of cultivars that we think do really, really well. And you can see that in the guide. And they are available for purchase actually at Forest Keeling Nursery out of Ellsbury, Missouri. I mentioned alley cropping, and I want to show you some footage that was taken just this summer at Cedar Hill Farms in Napton, Missouri, where they have been intercropping Chinese chestnut with winter wheat for the past five or more years. So let's take a look at the Stouffer's harvesting their winter wheat. That's just this summer. You actually see young chestnuts on the right, and their elderberry production, unrelated, is on the left. And in this case, they're using two passes with their harvester between each row of trees. Very, very effective, and they get very, very high yields of wheat. When you fertilize the wheat, it fertilizes the trees. So the trees get the bonus of uh, full coverage on the ground. And also, um, the, you'll, you'll notice is it's just early summer. The trees are a long way from producing their chestnuts and the wheat is already being harvested. So winter wheat is a particularly good intercrop for chestnut production. The next thing I wanted to talk about is our chestnut decision support tool. And that helps farmers with financial decisions. And it was developed by the former economist in the Center for Agroforestry, Dr. Larry Godsey, who's now a professor at Missouri Valley College. And basically, this is a downloadable Excel support tool, and it does three things. It will show you how much it costs to get into chestnuts, how much you can earn, and how long till you turn a profit just by playing with the choices under establishment and management and harvest and marketing. So you fill out the spreadsheet and it will immediately down in the bottom right give you different financial results in terms of rate of return and years to break even, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Let me talk briefly about two diseases of chestnut. The one that we have concerns about everywhere is called Phytophthora. And this happens when chestnuts grow in waterlogged soil, which is why I emphasize that they have to be planted in deep well drained soil. So uh, that's a concern everywhere. Even in our lust soils, we have had a few places where there's a little bit of a seep, and we have had a few trees lose, lost a few trees to Phytophthora root rot, but in general, we have no problems. We do not have a problem with chestnut blight. That is the fungus that kills the American chestnut, but the Chinese chestnut, which is what we grow, is basically co-evolved with the chestnut blight, so it's not an issue for us, and we don't lose any trees to chestnut blight. Another disease problem that is not an issue here in Missouri, but certainly is a concern in many parts of Ohio and parts east, is called blossom end rot. And that's another fungus that damages chestnut quality. And you can see in the lower right of the screen, the 
uh, chestnuts with a blackened spot. And when you cut those nuts open, you can see darkened uh, edible kernel. And so that's a concern and there's no real known control. It just doesn't happen to be a problem for us in our climate here in Missouri, thank goodness. There's two key pests I wanna cover very quickly. One is a chestnut weevil, which is very controllable. And then there's the chestnut gall wasp, which is only somewhat controllable and a problem. So the chestnut weevils lay their eggs in August when the chestnuts are sizing up inside the burr. And uh, the gall wasp actually will create damage earlier in the season. There are minor pests, and I uh, you know, show them in the lower left part of the screen, and you can read about control of those in our Growing Chinese Chestnut Guide. So chestnut weevil, if you pick chestnuts up promptly, even if they have weevils in them, the weevils will not have a chance to drop into the soil, and drop down a foot and start a cycle of infestation. So you can scout for weevils, you know, early August. And if you see any, you can take steps to control them. Chemical control works really well as much as we don't like chemicals and two or three applications of the chemical called seven trade name, which I know is not great for honeybees, in early to mid August will completely control your weevil outbreak. And there is also an organic control, and that's basically putting your harvested chestnuts into a hot water bath at just about exactly 120 degrees for 30 minutes, and then putting them into a cooler around freezing. Here's some photos from right to left. This is the Route 9 Co-op in Ohio. You can see they can bring in large containers of chestnuts and drop them into a cooler so that they can use this hot water bath technique to control chestnut weevil. The chestnut gall wasp is a bigger problem. It's not yet in Missouri, but it is in many points to the east. And it produces leaf and twig galls. And what do they do? They suppress the shoots from elongating, they reduce fruiting, and they cause twig dieback. There is partial biological control with parasitic wasps, but unfortunately it's a boom and bust cycle so that a couple of years you'll get good control when the parasitic wasp population builds up, but then reinfections do reoccur and that is a problem. So there's a picture earlier in the year with the galls developing uh, on the gall wasp. Later in the year, you can see the older gall, which has basically stunted all the new growth. And then the last picture, you can see the dieback that occurs from gall wasp infestation. So that's a problem. That's something we really have to figure out how to deal with it in the future rather than just suffer with it. Once it's harvest time, which is now in September and into October, you can mechanically harvest chestnuts very effectively. In order to do that, as you can see in this upper slide, you need a nicely mowed pickup surface. And not only nicely mowed, but it has to be free of twigs and debris because our commercial chestnut harvester, as you'll see in a minute, will get jammed up if there's twigs or debris so we use a flail mower, which is down here in the lower right, offset from the tractor to basically create a very nice pickup surface. So here is an example out at our Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center. You can see the good crop we have this year of the flail mower in action. And basically it just completely destroys all twigs and burrs and anything else along with the grass and breaks it into tiny little pieces. So this orchard before we start to harvest should be mown like your front lawn. And also with that flail mower, all the little pieces should be busted up. What are the ways to pick up chestnuts? Well, if you have a small orchard, or if your orchard is young, you can hand harvest. And in the upper pictures here, this is called a nut wizard. And it does a very nice job of picking up chestnuts by hand. But I know from doing this for years that if I work uh, a good eight to 10 hour day, with this nut wizard, I probably can harvest 400, maybe a little bit more per, per day. So if I have a couple thousand pounds or 4,000 pounds, me and another person could handle the crop. But if I have 25 acres of chestnuts, I'm producing 50,000 or more pounds, not a chance to pick these up by hand. So you have to go to a mechanical vacuum harvester. 
harvester, and I'll explain why. That mechanical vacuum harvester will suck the chestnuts up off the ground, separate the nuts from the burr, and you can harvest 1,000 pounds an hour. Now, while the price tag is anywhere from, say, twenty dollars to $75,000, compared to the cost of uh, commercial equipment for corn production, which are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for the combine, et cetera, this really is not an expensive piece of equipment. So we use a machine that comes from Italy by the company FACMA, F-A-C-M-A. And why do we use a vacuum harvester? Well, you can see two pictures of chestnuts here, one in the burr and one outside the burr. And you see that the chestnuts have at least one flat side, if not two. Well, a pecan harvester or a walnut harvester basically uses rubber fingers and their walnuts and pecans are round and that works. But for chestnuts, that flat side will just get pushed into the ground. So the only way to pick them up is to use a vacuum harvester. So here's a quick video of the chestnut harvester that we have out at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center um, at work. And I'll describe what we're seeing as we go along. I'm not, this is not a commercial for this particular brand. It's just the one that we were able to purchase and it came through a distributor for Italy. So there's our harvester, the FACMA 300. It works off a of PTO and you can see the chestnuts in the back. And it has these rubber sweepers, which basically move the chestnuts into this tube that you can see. And this tube has got a very strong vacuum and it sucks it up into the harvester. What happens then is that the chestnuts and the burrs and anything else is drawn up into these drums and separated. And the chestnuts end up back in these bags separated from the burr. So it works really well. So let's just look at it, the FACMA in operation for just a minute. Again, if you've got the orchard floor nice and clean in flail mode, it's going to work really well. And there won't be any times when you have to stop and clean out sticks and twigs that have stopped it from working well. So it's a nice piece of equipment and something that's necessary if you're going to harvest large quantities. Okay, so once you've picked up your chestnuts, what do you have to do? Well, there's a few more things you have to do. You have to float them and remove the bad ones. You have to sanitize them in some dilute Storox or Clorox solution. You then, as you can see in the center image, you sort them into size classes because different sizes have different prices. You put them in 25 pound bags, you store them in refrigeration, and basically, if you're a good marketer, you'll sell them out really, really quickly. So what about chestnut sales? Most sales, as I mentioned early on, are fresh chestnuts and not processed. And we've done a lot of survey work with consumers and also with grocers, and we know that both the public and the grocers know very little about chestnuts. So they need education as to how to buy them, how to store them, meaning refrigeration, and how to prepare them. Most consumers don't need, know that chestnuts, unlike walnuts or pecans, need to be refrigerated. Also, that they're gluten-free and very low in fat. So you need information about nutrition, and we've got this Why Chestnuts Guide, information of point of sale as to how to prepare them, how to store them, and how to cook with them. And all of that is available on our website. So we educate the consumer, and one way we do that normally, rather than a virtual chestnut roast, is a physical chestnut roast out at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center. We have a wonderful field day on the first Saturday of October, and typically we have two to 4,000 people come out, and we show people how to select chestnuts, how to store them, how to cook them. We have some wonderful cooking demonstrations. Fresh chestnuts are available for sale from local vendors. Chestnut trees themselves are available for sale from Forest Keeling Nursery. We have farm tours and information handouts and good time is had by all. And you introduce people to chestnuts if you aren't already familiar with them. So what can you do with chestnuts? Well, you can roast chestnuts on the open fire and that's lovely. You can boil chestnuts and that's a good way to 
you know, cook them also, but there's amazing number of things to do with chestnuts that you would never have thought of. You can dry chestnuts down and grind it into a gluten-free flour so you can make lots of baked goods. It's typical in, in France, for example, that you buy a honey-infused marron glacé, and you can see that picture in the lower left. In Europe, it's common to buy chestnuts as part of a sweet puree spread. There's also now, of course, chestnut beers produced in the U.S. as well as abroad. And they go in um, soups and breads, and you can cook with many kinds of meats. There's beers, there's liqueurs, and chestnut hummus, which I believe will have another little video about chestnut hummus production as part of our virtual chestnut roast. Now, the, the chestnut cuisine capital of the world without question is Italy. And here you can see on the street in Italy in the fall, a lot of roasting chestnuts being taking place. Um, interestingly, while the symbols for fall in the USA are maple leaves and pumpkins, the symbols for fall in Italy are chestnut leaves and burrs. It shows you how important they are to fall in Italy. So what can you do with chestnuts? Well, I had the privilege of going to an international chestnut conference many years ago, and there was a man from Florence, Italy, who had all these posters, and every one of these squares is a different dish that, was, that he made himself about chestnuts. So there's chestnuts used in appetizers, in soups, in the main course, and in desserts, but we're not done. Also, there's beers and liqueurs. There's all kinds of spreads and sauces, and there's all kinds of pastries. So the sky's the limit in terms of using chestnut as an ingredient. We have a number of resources on the Center for Agroforestry's website, which you can see at the bottom. We have our Growing Chinese Chestnuts in Missouri Guide. We have our Wide Chestnuts Nutrition Guide. We have our Floor Full Brochure. We have our uh, Financial Decision Support Tool, and on and on to help you with chestnuts. If you have more questions, there's three individuals to contact. There's my colleague, Dr. Ron Revord, and his contact information. There's me, Mike Gold, and there's also Aaron Templemeyer, who works out at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center. And finally, just so you're aware, there's Facebook page at HARC, there is um, a Facebook page, and many other things, Twitter, we have a, a podcast in agroforestry, and very importantly, down in the lower left, there's many more videos on our Mizzou Agroforestry channel. So thank you for your participation or for your attention, and uh, hope you're enjoying the virtual chestnut roast.